Welcome to With You Every Step, the solo travel podcast that explores, explains, and hopefully inspires you to travel the world by yourself. I'm your host, Michelle Lee. Welcome back to With You Every Step. This week, I have an exciting guest. I have an amazing actor, and he's an amazing Australian actor that pretty much most Australian actors know in the industry. If you talk to somebody and say, oh, have you met Don Bridges? They say, of course, and that's who it is. I have Don Bridges here. Welcome, Don. Michelle Lee, it is a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you about all your travels because you've just done some amazing travels. I have done a bit of traveling in the past few weeks, yes. Uh, The past month, I've been to Wales and a little town called Llanetli. Okay, I won't try and say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled double L A N E double L I. Yeah, and, and still gonna, double, not going to attempt that. <laughs> okay, so the double L sound in Welsh is <laughs> so you have to be oh. a bit gut, guttural. Oh, so clinically. Okay, so anyone that has misophonia probably won't like the sound of that. <laughs> not a lot. Not no. A lot. Okay, so you were over there for a festival? Yeah, it was the Carmarthen Bay Film Festival. And it's a very small festival. It's quite tiny, actually. In comparison to other film festivals around the world? In comparison to St Kilda Film Festival, which I've just been at quite recently. And uh, the opening night for St Kilda Festival has 3,000 people. Okay in the Palais Theatre, and it goes off. It's fabulous. The largest screening in Clanetli that I went to was 15 people. Oh, it's really tiny. Yeah, it's really tiny, except for our film, mm-hmm. which had 380 people. Oh, we, wow. we opened the festival. We had 380 people, 100 of whom were wearing costumes from Discworld. So if the, if the listeners know Terry Pratchett, He was a wonderful British writer. He died in 2014. He created a world called Discworld, which is peopled by witches and wizards and trolls and barbarians and all sorts of fabulous characters. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I've seen the movie that you're talking about that has been in these festivals, but I didn't realise it's part of a greater world. Oh, yeah, yeah. Discworld is a massive disc. It's sort of like Earth, except it's flat. Oh. And it floats on the back of four elephants standing on the back of a tortoise that crawls through space. That's how. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how that planet aligns. Okay. Yeah, it's great fun. And uh, Terry P- Terry Pratchett, people might know from uh, Good Omens. He was the co-author of Good Omens with Neil Gaiman. Okay. Yeah. The movie is called Trollbridge. And it's an 87-year-old, although we don't really know how old he is, he, even he doesn't know how old he is, barbarian who basically wears a leather jock strap and wields a very large sword. And don't be rude. Um, <laughs> and, and he's bald, he has a very long beard and he rides a talking horse. He's in search. His final quest is to find a troll and defeat it in one-to-one combat. And you played that character? I played, I played Cohen the Barbarian, yeah, who's the 87-year-old. Okay, can we ask how old are you, Don? I'm 68. Okay, so you were playing... I was ageing up yeah, a bit. Yeah, ageing yeah, up a bit. Yeah, yeah. And that... <laughs> I didn't think that character was meant to be that old. Oh, yeah, he's ancient. Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's very old. But he's still fighting, he's still a barbarian, and he's still very tough and very fast. yeah. And where did you film that? We filmed three days of it in New Zealand, in Queenstown, which is where we got all our beautiful, amazing footage, which is the location stuff. It's all mountains and valleys. We got the chance to do some helicopter stuff as well. Our final day got up, raced down to the airport. We found a helicopter pilot, got in the helicopter, went up for three hours, shot absolutely incredible footage. His name is Alfie, the pilot. Our cameraman, because they didn't have a special rig for the, for the helicopter, our cameraman was basically strapped in with the back door open, <gasps> hanging out of the back door with the camera. The shots are extraordinary. And at one stage, we were going down this ravine, which had a river at the bottom. 
we were flying down there and the camera guy, I heard him on the headphones say, all I can see is a wall. And the pilot just went, oh, yeah, hang on. And he turned the helicopter and flew sideways <gasps> down this ravine. And I'm just looking at a, a wall going past me. Oh. And I'm looking at the pilot going, is this all right? And he was so cool. They, I mean, they dropped me on top of a mountain, a, a big kind of razorback mountain. I walked across the ridge as they flew around shooting. Um, I was really hoping they'd come back for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a long way back to Queenstown and I didn't know which direction. Down. Down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> down. But it was all down on every, every which way. When we got back to the airport to fly back to Australia, we were talking to some people at the airport and we had axes and swords and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And they were, oh, you're making a movie? And he said, yeah, because they're so used to movies going through Queenstown. We were lined up waiting and this guy said, so what have you been doing? And he said, we said, well, oh, we went up in a helicopter this morning. He said, oh, great. Who did you go up with? And he said, Alfie. You went up with Alfie Spate? Yeah. He said, oh, man, he's the best. He did all the Lord of the Rings. We didn't even know. No wonder he knew where the best locations were because wow. we, we just lucked out with yeah. him. Absolute brilliant pilot. That's why he could go sideways along a wall. Yeah, yeah. He was pretty impressive. And he knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing and where to go to get. Obviously didn't brag in. about his accolades. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. Not at all. We have since. <laughs> How did you find actually flying into Queenstown? I've heard that's quite a scary flight because you can see the mountains on either side of you. And to drop into Queenstown, you actually have to... It's like a corkscrew. So you're actually going down in a spiral and the plane is on an angle as you're doing that. Our pilots, I don't know about other pilots, but our pilots on this commercial airline were so excited. They kept coming on the intercom and saying, oh, and if you look out to the left, you can see, you know, telling us what the mountains were. They were <laughs> so excited. They said, this is the best airport in the world to land at. I think anybody that's ever flown into Queenstown, if they're not terrified, would be very excited. It's a great trip in. I have fabulous. spoken to a pilot that flies in there and he said that only the best can do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not for everybody because it's quite a hard airport to fly into. Yeah, very hard. I think they come out more straight, but to get in, they, they have to spiral in. I think when they come out, they can actually get the lift and go up over the mountains. And when you were there for how many days of filming were you doing? Just three. Just three days yeah. of filming? Yeah. Did you have any time to go and no. do any adventures? No, I was in makeup at 4.30 each morning. How long were you in makeup for? Till dusk, till we wrapped each day. The, was it prosthetics? Yeah. Uh, it was a bald cap and a very long beard that came down almost to my knees. Was it heavy? Yeah, the beard is very heavy. Although it didn't bother me, but it was hard to keep it on because it resisted all the spirit gums that the makeup artist had. Yeah. So she devised a, a system where she ran wires across the top of my head to hold the beard in place and then stuck it and then put a ball cap on top of that. And everything had to be aged and my body, because I'm pretty much half naked for the whole film... They had to paint veins and give me a bit of contouring. Just... <laughs> give you a bit of ageing. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, no, no, contouring. Contouring as in, you know, abs. And muscles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look pretty good in the film. It's, you know, for an old... <laughs> <laughs> they made a coat for me, fabulous coat, which was full length. It was like a massive dressing gown. And it had pockets all the way through it inside. So it, we had hand warmers in it, pocket. When I put it on, it was like putting on a piece of toast. It was fabulous. I would take the coat off, jump out, do my bit. They usually had about three or four minutes before I would start to go into hypothermic because it was August in New Zealand on a mountain and it was freezing. Okay, so not an <laughs> ideal time to be no. basically naked on a mountain. no. Well, you know that. If you're going to shoot something in summer that has to look like summer, then you shoot it in the middle of winter on Port Melbourne Beach. 
and vice versa. If it's supposed to be freezing cold, they'll film it on the hottest day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I once shot a film on a, a rooftop in Melbourne and I don't know if people remember, it's about seven or eight years ago, there was a heat wave where it didn't go below 35 mm -hmm. for about four days mm -hmm. and every day was over 40. We were shooting three nights in a row on a rooftop in the middle of the city because, and it was supposed to be winter, so we had heavy overcoats and, oh. and hats on. It didn't go below 35 for the whole time we were shooting. And you looked cold? Yeah, that's called acting. <laughs> <laughs> so this last trip, tell me about what you just did. Okay, the last trip, I flew from Melbourne to KL, Kuala Lumpur, and when I got to KL, I thought, oh, it'd be great just to kick back and not have to sit in the public lounges and I'm, I'm not a frequent flyer, gold person. There's a place at Kuala Lumpur Airport called the Sen Sen Lounge, I think it's called, and it costs 20 bucks Australian and you go in and you can have a shower. Oh. And you can sit in their little lounge and there's food, real food, and you can make a good coffee and they have TV screens and they have, you know, all the departure boards and things very close. So you can keep an eye on when your flight is and everything. And I think I was in there for about two hours. It's just great to kick back and relax. I've always thought those places you needed to be a member to be able to get into. It's in a hotel. Oh, it's not at the airport. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's part of the airport. So okay. when you get off your plane, there's a rainforest, indoor rainforest, and then there's trains that run to other parts of the airport and into town you walk down past the trains and you come to this hotel and you go in and and it's a spa it's great it's really good and it's only 20 dollars. and you can can you spend as long as you like in there if you have like an eight hour delay or something overnight you could i think it's probably a bit more expensive because okay. it seemed it seemed to go by the hour but i only oh, i, I only it? needed two hours oh so okay i think so it might be 20 bucks for the first three hours okay i'm making that up <laughs> fact of the day, don't go by Dunn's Ooh. facts. <laughs> Flew from KL to London and I've got a good mate in London. He picked me up at the airport, which is always a bonus. Stayed with him for a couple of nights, stayed with another friend in another part of London and then another friend in another part of London and then we drove to Bath and from Bath I caught the train down to Planetly. You love saying that, I don't do. you? <laughs> I do. It took me a couple of days to learn, so I'm not letting that one go to waste. So how did you get there again? Sorry, you got the train. On the train, yeah. And how was the train? It was great. Booked a first class ticket because I got online and I realised that they have sales of certain seats for certain days. So it's really worthwhile getting on the website and just checking what's what's around. And I saw one that was really cheap. It was like, 16 pound or something and it was normally up to 90. Oh that's a good discount. And then when I got the ticket it was first class. I thought oh great fantastic. I was on my way to the to my first class seat and <laughs> as I was walking through the through the train I heard my name called and I looked at this young man and young woman sitting together and I thought I don't know you. <laughs> Who, how do you know me? It was a guy called Christian Bloch. Christian is German, but he lives in LA and he was also there for the premiere. Christian is a special effects supervisor. Oh. So he built all the special effects. He built the trolls. He and uh, the woman he was with, Anna, and she's German. And the two of them had met that day for the first time. Had, and you had never met them and before? And I'd never met them. So they obviously knew you because they'd been editing yes. you. <laughs> yeah. They'd been watching my ugly mug for, you know, eight years. Yeah. The interesting thing is that they had been working very closely for three or four years. She's a, a 3D special effects expert. They'd never met before that day, even though they'd worked and closely. spoken on the internet every day for three years. That was the first time they'd met. And that's kind of the way the industry is going in some ways now, mm. that you work with people, but you never actually meet them. Yeah, I know. I've heard of this new thing now with voiceovers as well. Oh, yeah. That you can do a voiceover anywhere in the world that can go to another country and they yep. can direct you from another country. You don't even meet these people. No. Yeah, it's quite it's amazing technology. Bizarre. <laughs>
I see. I go back to the old days of voiceovers when you went into the studio and there were a group of actors in there. You know, there'd be three, four, five people, and it was so much fun. Because you can actually look and work off each other compared yeah. to now, everyone does it solo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it created a, a much happier vibe, and you could hear it in the ads. Yeah, but, you know, that could have a lot to do with it. And I think that's the same with, you know, your big productions, your animations. They all do them solo. And you'll hear actors say that, oh, I've never met this person and they're in a movie together. <laughs> yeah. And they've got heaps yeah. of scenes together, but yeah. they've never met. Yeah, exactly. When, when we were shooting the film, I was working op- opposite a really wonderful actor called John Jenkins. John's not in the film. His voice is in the film. But he was wearing a green lycra suit, which was really attractive. <laughs> And he was wearing ping pong balls on stalks. And so I couldn't even make eye contact because I had to look at the ping pong balls because that was where my eye line was because uh-huh. he was – the character was so much bigger than mm. John was. And then we you know, we had Troy Larkin as well on the Which my listeners should know, Troy. Playing a character called Beryl. He didn't even have a green suit. They just – animated over the top of him. Well, he is very animated anyway. (laughs) Yeah, very, very, very. Okay, so back to your train trip that you booked Mm, online that you were in first class and you got stopped by these people. So I ended up sitting with them all the way. Not in first class. No, I sat with them in a spare seat near them in cattle class. (laughs) How nice of you. Did you even go check out first class? I went and had a look. And yeah. was it good? Well, I, I actually left my bags there, and which is really silly to do on, on a train. Mm-hmm. And I heard my name being paged. And I said, can you please see the train manager? And I went, oh, my God, what have I done? He said, oh, I found your card in your bag. And um, so we called you because uh, you shouldn't be leaving your bags on the train. And attended. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah, of course and he said, oh, it's okay, you can leave them there now, but don't do that in, in future. How long of the train ride was it? From That was from Bath to Flanetli. I think it was about three hours, two or three hours. Yeah. Okay. And then back to London, it was about four hours. Did and you that, have a window seat? Could you see out? I could for some of the trip, yeah. I think that's the thing on trains. It depends yeah. where you sit to the view you get. Oh, and I get much. motion sickness. And for some reason for me, I have to, which most people are the opposite. They have to sit the same way the train's going. Oh, I yeah. have to sit the opposite. I, I have to sit with my back to the way we're going because I feel like the motion going so fast past the window is what makes me sick. Is that a reflection on your life? It's so are you happier looking at what's gone than what's on the way? No, I don't think I look either way. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just in the present. (laughs) Ah, yeah. Okay. I'm all about you right now, Don. That's all I care about. I just wanted to talk about you for a moment, Michelle. (laughs) Trying to analyse me. Yeah. (sighs) Anyway, it comes back to motion sickness, not about my (laughs) outlook on life. Of course. Of course. Yes. You get there. You get to Wales. Yeah. No, you get to the place I'm not going to attempt to call. Clandestly? Yeah. Yep. Which is in South Wales. So it's about an hour south of Cardiff. Okay. And it's a beautiful little town. It's really cute. There's there's beaches. Not that I think anybody would ever use them because it's quite chilly. And you were there in summer? Yeah. And what's their summer weather like? Well, it was nice, but it was about 20... 324 during okay. the day. It was, it was, they were beautiful days. Yeah, that's more than blue I thought skies, it was going to be. Blue skies, sun was out, it rained. You expect a bit of everything when you're traveling. And we're from Melbourne, we're used to it. Exactly. Just put something on. Mm-hmm. I, when I was looking for accommodation, I, I used Google Maps to look for accommodation. So You if, used Google Maps? Yeah. Really? Yeah, because Google Maps throws up all the accommodation. You can actually see it. So you hadn't pre-booked anything? No. Well, oh, yeah, I, I had. I booked it from Australia. Okay. Before, when I booked it, I used Google Maps to book it. I have never thought of using Google Maps. Yeah, I've used Google Maps to see what's close yeah. and then kind of gone on to other sites to have a look at them. But I've never actually used Google Maps itself. You know, you know how you can do Street View? Yeah. Really handy because you can look at the actual building from all around it. Yeah. And you can see, you know, anything that might be a little bit dodgy because they'll show up in the maps. 
Yeah, that's a really good tip. I've never thought of doing that before. And if you click on it, you get information about the hotel as well. Yeah. You know, they, they show where the hotels are. Or they yeah, show and the now hotels. everyone does Google reviews. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And Clever. you can And you can even book through them. I was looking at one hotel and it was it was it looked really cool. It had a turret and it was old. It just looked like a really cool hotel. And then I started reading a bit about it and, and somebody had written, do not stay in this hotel. It's a party hotel. They don't finish till three. And you went, I'm booking. Well, I thought about it. <laughs> you know me, I like, I like a party. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, no, maybe not. Because I started looking close and there was another place about 100 metres away. And I thought, oh, oh, I'll book that. So I booked it. I didn't, re- <laughs> didn't really read much about it. And it was a really lovely room. When I got there, I realised it was a B&B. And there were two rooms and a shared bathroom. But I was the only one staying there. Oh, otherwise you would have had to share the bathroom? But it would have been, it would have been fine if I was sharing okay. anyway. you don't mind. No. You're not a princess like N- I am. No. <laughs> and it was run by a mad Lithuanian couple. Absolutely great. So when you're saying mad, you mean good in a nice way. Oh, yeah, way. yeah, good mad, okay. good mad. And she was great. She was just lovely. At one stage she came down and she said, and do you have washing? I said, oh, yeah, it's okay. I'll go to the laundromat. She said, no. No, you give me. I will do washing. And she took my washing off and brought it back ironed Aww. and folded. I mean, she knickers was... Knickers too? Did she iron your knickers? She didn't iron those, oh. Michelle. <laughs> my socks, yes. <laughs> she was a delight. And then her husband arrived back. So about 10 o'clock one night, I get a knock on the door and, and he says, uh, I, I was wondering, do you drink alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> and I... Sort of smiled and nodded politely. (laughs) Anyway, he said... That was a yes, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that that was a definite yes. Yeah. He said, "Eh, I will come back in uh, 10 minutes. And he went away and he came back with a plate of rye bread, which was baked in Lithuania the previous day. It was beautiful rye bread and smoked bacon, which I wasn't that partial to. And then a glass, like a whiskey whiskey tumbler. Mm Mm-hmm half full of a clear liquid. Mm. And I said, hmm, this looks interesting. Is it vodka? I would have said vodka. That would have been my first guess. And he said, mm, no, no, it's um, a grain, uh, like uh, rye. I said, oh, like whiskey. He said, yes, but uh, Lithuanian, how you say, um, moonshine. It was amazing. Mm. It was aged. It wasn't just rot gut. It was really tasty. And strong, I can imagine. Yeah, very strong. High percentage of alcohol. When I was leaving, they gave me a bottle of it, a, a small bottle. A but, small bottle. But, um, well, a small bottle that Don is <laughs> holding and it looks like bigger than a ruler, which is bigger than 30 centimetres. That doesn't look that small yeah, to no, me. It's, that was a small bottle. <laughs> did they go to the premiere of the she movie? She did. He was still away. She came okay. to the premiere and just loved it. She was, she'd never been before, so she was over the moon. And so she cooked you breakfast every morning? The, or was it the breakfast was in the fridge. There was a fridge. The room was great. It had everything and so much food that she'd left. Do you remember how much biscuits. you paid for it? Ooh. It was a little bit cheaper than the hotel. Sounds like it was better yeah, service yeah, it though. Was. It was great. It was around about 100 bucks a night, I think. So you made the right choice. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes, yours I... came with moonshine. So. <laughs> and washing. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so good. Yeah, they were really, really lovely people. So it, it pays to kind of look around. Yeah. And, and I like the unexpected as well, when you don't know kind of what you're booking. I mean, that can end up terribly, but in your case, it ended up beautiful. It when could have been a disaster. Could have been a disaster. Yeah, but yeah. it wasn't. So no, that's good. No, it sounds lovely. And did they want to stay in contact with you as well? Oh, yeah. They, they've added me on Facebook. So, yeah. you know, we, we say hello occasionally. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. That's the best thing about travelling, especially in something like that where it is very personal because it's like their home in a way, right? They live there. Yeah. Yeah. They live upstairs and in the basement and the ground floor is two beautifully pointed rooms, really beautifully furnished and kind of velvet wallpaper and chandelier. I mean, it was quite gorgeous. And the other room was was similar. It was empty. Oh, it was empty. Mm, The other room was never used while I was there. 
Okay. I thought you meant it had no furniture in it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it was empty. Is that yeah. like where they put the naughty people? <laughs> yeah, people can bring their own sleeping bag. <laughs> I was thinking more about like if they're a bad guest, that's where they lock them up. Yeah. And I go straight for the dark, don't and I? And <laughs> you will not be allowed access to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> The visual I had was not the visual that you were <laughs> explaining. <laughs> I can't help your mind, Michelle. <laughs> always straight to the dark, always. <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> so how many days were you there for? I was down there for, I think, six days, six or seven days. Some of the Discworld people lived down in that area and they swooped us up and took us out to castles and oh, we had a great time. Went, mm. went to two castles. I think we went to three castles over two days. In that area? Yeah, two two in that area and one that was just outside Cardiff. That That's a, an amazing castle because they restored a lot of it really sensitively. But you can actually go inside and there's rooms and there's banquet rooms. and oh, I haven't great. really been inside many. I've been outside because a lot of yeah. them you can't go in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This was Caerphilly Castle. So if you're in Cardiff, go to Caerphilly Castle. It's a really great. This, they've got dragons. <gasps> what do you mean they've got dragons? They've got, they've got these big plaster cast dragons, but they're all painted and they're fabulous. And there's a pit and they're in the pit. Oh, that sounds cool. And there's smoke and, you know, it's really atmospheric. It's brilliant. Have you been to Hong Kong? I have, yeah. And the dragon holes that they have in the buildings? Troy was telling me oh, about really? them. Oh, really? I don't know about those. Well, apparently the buildings actually have big holes. Do you remember yeah. seeing them? I just thought they'd built they them were... badly. <laughs> no, they were for dragons. Wow. They're the dragon holes. So dragons fly through them and not into the building. How brilliant. I know. Who'd have thought of it? The Hong Kong people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see the dragon flying through. Yeah, me too. It'd be pretty scary. Like, it'd be great lying in bed and watching a dragon fly, <laughs> fly over the top of your hotel. It was going to go straight through the hole. Straight through the middle. Brilliant. I know. Yeah. Okay, so then what did you do? Then I went back to London for a few days and stayed with a, a friend in a place called Gerard's Cross. And Gerard's Cross is a great little town. It's a village. It's quite close to Heathrow Airport and quite close to Pinewood Studios. It's a pretty expensive place to live. I think Ozzy Osbourne lives there and, you know, various other famous people. Mm -hmm. The next door neighbours for, for my mate, he's actually a New Zealander, but he's been there for 20 odd years, is telling me about people moved in next door and they had a a van pulled up, they unloaded all their stuff onto the driveway and then it started raining and the van left. My mate went out to help them. He said, do you need a hand getting stuff into the garage? They said, oh, yeah, thanks, that'd be great, that'd be great. So he's helping carry stuff into the garage and it's Roman pillars and a massive gold bath. Mm. And he said, what is all this stuff? And the guy said, oh, my wife's a set designer. This is stuff from Gladiator. That's Russell Crowe's bath. She's a set designer. He's a Steadicam operator. For those who don't know, a Steadicam is a device that camera fits on. It straps on to the cameraman and they can run or walk with the camera and get a, a shot that looks like a smooth tracking shot. It's an amazing piece of equipment and very, very skillful people need to, be, uh, need to use them. And he, he does that and they both work at Pinewood Studios. So, yeah, it's all around that area. There's a direct train line into London, which takes about 20 minutes, and it's really efficient, really good, and just a nice place to be. A couple of great pubs, really good food in England now. Yeah. It's certainly changed from when I lived there in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> British food was basically baked beans with an egg on top of bacon, and the food now is absolutely amazing. I had a gnocchi. At the pub, that was pea and asparagus was, I know it sounds mm. odd. It does sound odd. It was absolutely stunning with parmesan cheese shaved on Potato top. Potato gnocchi? Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, you've also done filming in other 
locations. Yes. Can you tell me about <laughs> some of the more odd locations? Well, the, the less travelled places you've yeah. been to. Okay. Last year, towards the end of the year, I did a film, which it was at the time called Flesh and Blood. Oh. So it was called Flesh and Blood. It's a cannibal horror film. Sounds disgusting. It does. Gary Sweet, Kerry Armstrong, Kev Harrington, really lovely cast of people. We were filming in a town. Oh, and it's not called that anymore. I don't know what it's called. Even the producers haven't quite made up their mind yet. Hasn't been released yet. No. At one stage, it was going to be Two Heads Creek. <laughs> so, okay, uh, it's, it's still a under revision. Broad, it's a revision. fairly broad Australian <laughs> comedy, Michelle. <laughs> so we were we were filming in a town called Krakow, C R A C O W, spelt like the one in Poland, but mm. the locals don't say Krakow; they say Krakow. Krakow. So it's Very Aussie. it's three hours southwest Rockhampton. So Rockhampton is in Queensland. On the coast, yeah. On the coast. So or this near the is coast. if you're visualizing Australia and we've got the big peak at the top, it's yep. kind of up that end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And six hours drive northwest of the Gold Coast. So okay. it's in a there's a triangle and it's it's there. It's an area called the Pineapple Coast. No, Pineapple Coast? No. Uh, pineapple no, it's not that. Something else, anyway. Something it, to do with pineapples? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> when you get there, there's nothing there. <laughs> we were there for six weeks. You should have seen Don's face uh, there. Uh, he was like, he's going to tell me something super exciting and there's nothing there's there. There's nothing there. So we arrived there and there's a pub, a, a really good pub, a, yeah. and that was our main location. And there's a few houses which are very spread out. So not many people live here? There's 17 people live in the town. And so the pub is the busiest place? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of people live out of town around. So there's Krakow Station, which is about 20 k's away. It's a beautiful part of the country. It's very green, very verdant. It has great grazing land for cattle. There's a gold mine just outside town. Ah, uh, what I was thinking was why does anyone live there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So there's about 100 people work at the gold mine okay. at any one time and they work on, you know, they, they fly in, fly out. Mm-hmm. And is that pub the closest yeah. thing to the gold mine? It's the only. only thing. The gold mine is self-sufficient. So it has accommodation. We stayed at the gold mine. So that okay. was our accommodation as well for the actors. Uh, the crew stayed in the old hospital which they renovated to get ready for the people the influx of crew and it was great it was like a big community house it was fabulous kind of creepy though no it was great didn't have any creepy vibe no there were probably some ghosts but there were a lot of people there so you know they kept them quiet they had a great time they had guitars and you know did all that stuff in their downtime watched movies the gold mine has a a 24-hour canteen so they have three chefs at any one time and the chefs will cook you a meal for a four hour time frame Mm -hmm. so it it coincides with the miners clocking on and clocking off so they have four hours so that they can get food and whatever they also have a 10 before 10 rule they're pretty hard drinkers up there oh so they'll have they can have 10 drinks before 10 o'clock either end of the clock in the morning or in, in the, the evening. morning because well, if, if work- they're working overnight that's yeah. their knock off time yeah oh i don't know about having 10 drinks before 10 a.m. in the morning yep if they have 10 before 10 and not 11 they can still clock on the next morning because they have to be breathalyzed before they go down the mine wow it's it's pretty full on i kind of think if i had 10 drinks in a short amount of time i might not be <laughs> <laughs> okay to work the next day. That's mm. just how I'm thinking. Yeah. Do they all do the 10 or do they have like one or two drinks? Oh, some, some don't do 10, but that, there's that rule if they want to get on it. Yeah, they'll 10's do 10 max. before 10. Yeah. yeah. And there are breathalysers all around the camp, so you can go in and we had a lot of fun with that because mm. <laughs> we didn't necessarily have to be sober. We weren't always. Kev Harrington and I. Got to go down the mine. We went 750 metres underground and it's an amazing trip because you, you go down in a four-wheel drive. You don't, there's no lift shafts or anything like that. Drive all the way down and it's 
mind blowing what's down there. But huge trucks. Did you see gold? No. They even the miners don't see the gold. It's oh. there. They know it's in the ore, but it has to be extracted through the machinery. Yeah. Through the crushing and then they use arsenic or something to pull it out. I don't oh. I don't know the process. But no one had to get to pick any more. No. And if you want to actually buy anything apart from beer, you have to drive sixty kilometers. <gasps> To the nearest town, which is Theodore. So they only have beer? Oh, they have beer and spirits and wine at the pub. But it, if you want to actually you get, mean get buy chocolate. Or toothpaste. <laughs> or toothpaste, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those sort of things, yeah, not, not there. 60 k's away in Theodore. So we, we often went up to Theodore because of the beautiful river there. We did a lot of river swimming while, while we had, when we had days off. Nice weather, though. The weather was hot. The first week was really hot. It was in the 40s. And then we were there for five weeks. The next four weeks were milder. Still hot, but mild. Do they ever get backpackers going through there? Yeah. They do? Yeah, they do. Really? Yeah. Why do the backpackers go there? To work at the pub. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty iconic pub. All right. So if you're a backpacker wanting to go around Australia, that might be a place that you can go. not a bad spot. Uh, There's nothing to spend your money on. (laughs) Well, that's a good thing as a backpacker. You want to save money. Yeah, exactly. You want a real experience. And the guy that owns the pub, people might remember there used to be boxing tents that used to tour all around Australia. There's still some that go around Queensland. And the What are they? Boxing tents? Boxing tents. What does that mean? Roll up, roll up, fight my fighter. Oh. So they they have uh, a group of fighters and you pick which guy you're going to punch. No. Pick, pick which guy you're going to fight. They had a bit of trouble keeping Gary Sweet out of the ring because he wanted to have a go. <laughs> and um, somebody had to point out to him that perhaps it wasn't a good idea because he had to go on set the next morning yeah. with a, an unbruised, unmarked face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe that still happens. Yeah. And yeah. what happens if you win? You get money? Yeah. And the pride of, you know, having taken on one of these boxes. They, they don't lose. No, I couldn't no, imagine they would if this is their really, job. They're really, really good boxers. They tend to play to the level of the person they're fighting. Okay. They read them very quickly and they're very, very good fighters and they can beat anybody that steps up. So why would you go against them? Because, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to have a go, mate. What, are you going to have a go? Yeah, I'll have a go. It's all that Australian Masculine. boy stuff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> mm, I don't understand it. No, me neither. <laughs> Anyway, a few of our a few of our crew went up. They did, and, yeah, and got up and fought. How'd it go? Oh, one of the guys did really well. He still when, lost. When does when does it stop? When you get do you get knocked either out? Either when you get knocked out or when the referee says that's enough. Okay, so yeah. there is a referee to make sure that yeah. they're safe and yeah. no one's getting really hurt. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the guy that runs those boxing tents owns the pub. So the pub is full of all this amazing memorabilia. There's labels on things and you go, is that really Farlap's bridal? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Who knows? It's, it's an interesting pub to stop and have a look at. And if you, if you find Krakow on Google Maps, click on it, photos of the pub come up. Okay. So you can see what it is. And it's a, it's a cracker of a pub. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other locations? Oh, years ago, we, I did uh, All the Rivers Run, uh, which was a, a Crawford's production about riverboats up in Ichuka. And it was the show that put Sigrid Thornton on the map. And She's a very famous Australian, Australian actress. Yeah, and another Australian actor called John Waters. And it was all about paddle boats going up and down the Murray River, which is a big river in the north of Victoria that is the divide between Victoria and New South Wales. So it's the paddle steamers used to go up and down the river and, and that was how people moved wool and wheat and all those things in those days. The paddle steamers are very romantic and mm. they're beautiful. Um, I've been things. up there for a friend's mother's birthday. We went on one of the paddle steamers for lunch and it was beautiful. Oh, it's lovely. So we got to stay in Echuca for a couple of weeks. I, I, I didn't have a big role in the film, but it was a beautiful place to be for a couple of weeks and hanging out on the river because I was one of, the, one of the crew on the river boat. So we just got to hang out on the boat all day and go cruise up and down the Murray and get up and shoot a scene. 
go back to lying on the wool bales. Nice. <laughs> yeah. It was Tough life it was you've cool. had. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's better than others. Absolutely. Life of an actor. Yeah, exactly. It can be very high and very low. There are some lows, yes, as as we all know. I think in anybody's life there's highs and lows, but they're possibly a bit more extreme with an actor because you, you're not in control of your own work in a lot of cases. You have to wait for someone else to give you a job. Mm. It's hard to go out and say, oh, I'm going to apply for that job because that job, I can do that because there'll be 10 other actors applying for the same job that can do the job as well or better than you. <laughs> It's a job where you're not really in control of your own destiny mm. in a lot of cases. But you love what you do. Oh, God, yeah, of course. It'd be mad to do it if you didn't love it. True. You know that, Michelle. I do. <laughs> we are approaching our destination. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts for the final five. Your favourite city or town? I would have to say it would be somewhere in Ireland. I love Ireland. Maybe not Dublin because it's a bit city-fied. I really like Galway. It's a great town. Is that the one that has a song about it? Oh, yeah. In, the uh, Galway Girl, is that that song? Very probably. I went to a film festival there a few years ago and it was absolutely one of the best places. It was a hoot. Weirdest food you've ever eaten? I would say it was in Beijing and I'm not exactly sure what it was. <laughs> <laughs> there were What did it look like? Well, there were photographs on the wall and it might have been chicken, but there's no guarantee to what it was. Okay. I managed to eat it, but I still don't know quite what it was. Beaches or mountains? For me, I think mountains, although I do love a beach. I probably changed a bit. I, I used to be beach and now more mountain, I think. A tourist site that you recommend is a must-see. tourist site that's a must-see would be the Vasa Museum in Stockholm. Oh. Amazing. Tell Absolutely me about amazing. it. So the Vasa was a ship that was, I can't remember what year it was built, but it was built a long, 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 long time ago. And it was underwater for about 400 years because it sank on its maiden voyage. It toppled over and sank to the bottom of the little harbour just outside the palace in Stockholm and everyone was there. The king was there. Everyone was there to see this ship and they put too many cannons on it. It came down the slipway, keeled over and sank straight to the bottom. They raised it about 15 or 20 years ago and they built this museum around it. It's massive. It's really, really huge, but you can walk all around it. You can go on board you can, and it's restored. So it sat, it didn't rot away because it was preserved by the mud at the bottom of the harbour. Incredible place to go. And it's fairly close to the ABBA Museum if that's your thing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've actually heard about that recently. Someone told me about that. I'd never heard of it before. How long would you spend there? At least three or four hours. Oh, quite a long time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. three or four hours. Okay. Can you say thank you in another language? Tak. Oh, what language is that from? That is Swedish. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure picking your brains about your locations that you've filmed and gone to and watched your films premiere in. Thank you, Michelle. It's been an absolute delight. Thanks for listening to With You Every Step, hosted by Michelle Lee. We do hope you enjoyed listening. And if you did, make sure you tell everybody. If you didn't, nobody likes a Debbie Downer. Please subscribe to get up to date with our latest releases and give us a thumbs up on our social media at With You Every Step. We love to hear from you. If you have any questions or inquiries, head to the Contact Us page at our website, michellelee.com. That's also where you'll find all our blogs mentioned in the podcast. We love to hear from you and if we have inspired you to travel. Thanks for listening. Love life and adventure on.